Sorry, I just forgot to turn on the recording because I didn't want to record while you were talking. I just turned it on over. And it is this prior unity that we need to understand more clearly. As Husserl says on page 63, and this is toward the bottom in the italics, we are looking toward, quote, a new region of being, which has its ownness, its eigenheit, and that we notice out of the act of bracketing that we do. This new region on page 64 at the top, first line, is a region of individual being. That is to say, by moving toward the prior unity of consciousness and world, we can come to see more clearly how each thing we experience claims to be meaningful, claims to be its own self-maintaining and self-giving unity within that region. At least that's how I interpret the word individual here. We will start, Husserl says on page 64, with consciousness in the natural attitude. Uh, and this goes towards Jeremy's question. And pay attention to how it includes all, quote, mental processes in the first full paragraph or erlebnissen. We will look imminently within consciousness. This means that we are trying to see consciousness on its own terms as it gives itself over to the prior unity that we call experience which is certainly consciousness experience, but is consciousness insofar as it gives up its presumption of separation. What we see in imminence is, of, in other words, is that there is no hard impermeable boundary to the world. There is instead transcendence within imminence. Our first step of this, and this is on page 65 in the middle in italics, of this new eidetic analysis is the discovery that the bracketing leaves us with consciousness in relation to being. And so this is at the bottom in italics. Consciousness has in itself a being of its own, absolute essence, which is not touched by phenomenological exclusion. So Bill, I think even here, you can see the link between what consciousness is and other essences it may may find. So I have a question. How is it that the general thesis, the, the positing of the natural attitude, which is put out of play, does not take with it all claims to being? I think the answer is this. All we have put out of play is the assumption, the prejudice, that being was separate from consciousness. We now see being is the very life of consciousness, and soon we will come to see being, its own being, as the interplay of imminence and transcendence. We thought transcendence was obvious. It was outside of us. We did not yet see that transcendence is interwoven with imminence. As Husserl says on page 66, consciousness has, quote, a being of its own, Eigensein. But this means a great deal. Ownness does not simply mean me versus the world. In fact, what we have is rather the reverse, at least in the natural attitude. As he says on page 66, first full paragraph in the middle, in the natural attitude, nothing else but the natural world is seen. So it's not us versus the world, it's us learning to see those things together. Um, much like Felix was saying, the abyss and the steps to access. We are learning to see differently as phenomenologists, not the separation of one or the lionization of one or the reduction of one to the other, but the two together. In section 34 on page 68, Husserl talks about lived experiences that present themselves. And the word there is auftreten, in full concreteness. So if you look at the very bottom of the page, it says, we consider mental processes, their lateness, and the entire fullness of the concreteness within which they present themselves. This agency of experiences as self-presenting is perhaps what motivates Husserl to pursue the fact that just as consciousness has its ownness, each lived experience at the top of page 69 has an essence of its own. Each experiential act makes a claim a radical participation in being. The question then is what makes up the ownness of each type of lived experience, each type of act, memory, perception, expectation, 
essential intuition, to go back to Bill's question, et cetera. What does each act have to say about how being works and how being requires a new type of experience in each case? I'm gonna move on to section 35. Before answering that question about the ownness of each act, however, Husserl looks further into the shared essence of lived experiences. What makes each lived experience the same kind of thing as the others, given their radical differentiation or radical ownness? Each lived experience, Husserl says, has the relation of cogito to cogitatio to cogitatum, the I think to each act of thinking to each object of thinking as its structure. As such, each lived experience indicates modes of being that are together and yet radically different. The thing in consciousness, as in, in section 35, the example of perceiving the piece of paper, are together by design and yet are together by presenting their differences from one another. To go along with the previous discussion in the sessions, in this last session, uh, about the world as horizon or halo, as Husserl has said, we now see in this section that each act of intuition on page 70, each kind of act has a halo, a halo of background intuitions. That's in the middle of page 70, almost directly in the middle with background intuitions in italics. The halo of other acts, non-actional, because I'm not living in them right now, allows us to continuously improve an intuition of things which are necessarily given from one side or one moment at a time. Our regard and attention is thus a continuous shifting of what is implicit into what is explicit, whether we are in memory, perception, or expectation. Our regard and its turning maps onto the meanings not yet explicit in the manner in which the thing is given to us. The halo of intuitions is thus the more of consciousness, but it's the more as the system of convertibility. The halo, both world and consciousness have this as a structure, right? The halo is the system. And this system is called for possible and necessary because our regard maps onto shifts in givenness. Our shifting actions from non-actional to actional extends and releases givenness from itself. As Husserl says on page 72, this is in the middle of the page again in italics, the stream of mental processes, the stream of lived experiences can never consist of just actionalities. Our consciousness as total, and it is total, is never fully active or awake. Consciousness also functions behind its own attending as a background system into which we feel ourselves plugged and which we only discover through work and only or at least often retrospectively. On page 73 at the top, we are a medium of non-actionality. It's the very top, page 73 as much as a direction and enactment of actionality. We are flux, and this sense of ourselves as regard plus halo, actional plus a halo of non-actional actions, is what allows us to see that experience itself is that in which we fit, to which we belong, and that situates us in relation both to the world and to ourselves. Very briefly in section 36 on page 73. In this section, Husserl emphasizes the biting into consciousness of the thing when he insists on page 73 that consciousness is consciousness of. And when he says on page 74 that consciousness is both, and this is uh, sort of towards the bottom of that only paragraph, um, that consciousness is both its own basically facticity and also it's where of. He actually says, um, not only that it is consciousness, but also where of it is consciousness. In section 37, Husserl tries to describe, although not yet using the word, 
the noetic acts of attending and regarding more closely. Now I've used the word regard in a non-technical way just to get us into this, but he's gonna be more careful here. For him, regarding openness, attention, these are not further acts in distinction from memory, perception, and expectation. And that comes on page 76. Regarding openness, attention, these are the particular way in which I intend the object. In talking about regard and attention, then, Husserl names the power that I bring to the table of our meeting, I and the object. But the act of lived experience, the act of perceiving, say, surpasses both me and it. The experiences themselves in which I regard, am open or attend, situates us both. An even greater example of us being situated arises, as he says in this section, in a higher level experience of a value. We are there in the experience of the valued object as valued. For example, of a beloved or a child or a favorite book or a pleasant day during which our arthritis does not hurt so much or in the experience of a tree that is blossoming in the yard. We are there, so the valuable character of the object appears immediately. We are attuned to it, attend to it in its value, turned towards it as valuable. We see the thing directly and we seize upon it, discriminate it out of its environment. We are with its value and yet do not separate the value from the thing. And this is on page 77, what I'm about to say. It's in the first full paragraph and it, it comes in the dual intensio. You can see that italicized about three lines down. Seeing the thing as valuable thus involves us in a twofold advertedness. We are multitaskers, seeing the thing and seeing the thing as. But this means attention in its twofoldedness cannot call attention to itself as such. Like perhaps Kant, on the disappearance of beauty if the free play of imagination and understanding is interrupted by self-consciousness. Here too, Husserl intimates that the possibility of the experience of valuing as one built on and simultaneous with perception entails allowing ourselves to be situated by means of the experience as such in its twofoldedness and by means of the thing in its self-givenness. So we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about section 38 and then open it up for questions or comments for about 10 minutes. Nevertheless, the situating overarching character of experience as such needs to be further described. For although attention and regard are not acts of their own, the power of reflection is not just an interruption it is a helpful tool. And so now we move into like this other power that consciousness has that has to help us determine what it is. Um, it's a helpful tool and as such is what we follow in order to understand how radical the community is. And if you remember, I highlighted that term radical community in last time, how radical the community is between consciousness and world. We could make each act of the cogito into an object by means of reflection. Our living in the experience can be converted into seizing upon our act as such within its inherent earing into the object. And thus we reflect the lived experience of the object into an object itself as a whole. Sally, this goes into towards your question. Such an object, the lived experience as such, is imminent and first sets up the difference between the manner of appearance of the lived experience and the manner of appearance of the object as adumbrated. And this difference will be decisive in understanding the power and uniqueness of the unity of experience as such. Experiences as lived wholes, as reflected objects, are not adumbrated. They are the givenness of subject and object together. The object within the experience appears as necessarily adumbrated, as guiding us from and toward a whole perception of itself by means of, through its appearance as, 
structured within one side at a time, or as moments that are taken up within a whole, as color moments within the surface of the desk are taken up into the perception of the desk's surface coloring as brown, et cetera. So what I see this section leading to is an appreciation of the fact that the stream of lived experience as a flow is a structure determined by each experience as embracing otherness without generating, containing, or mastering it. That is, I see the reflection on the difference between the adumbrated and non-adumbrated as taken up in the experience as the whole. I see that fact as giving us the understanding that each experience embraces otherness, unlikeness, without generating or mastering it. So that was a, a fairly quick and non, uh, non exhaustive way through sections 33 to 38. And I'd like to pause and allow everyone to say what's on their mind for those sections. You could just go. Go ahead, Olga. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Peter. Uh, I read the book before. I never experienced it uh, as so powerful. Um, but then, um, and I don't understand why I cannot just give into this uh, power and uh, why my mind uh, looks for objections. But uh, so it's not really a question, but more kind of playing devil's advocate and say, seeing if objections hold. Um, and the objection is, uh, isn't it hypostasizing consciousness and turning it into some kind of an Aristotelian substance? And um, so why wouldn't be, or would we be able to attain uh, the same um, effective discovery and new results, new finding by analyzing consciousness as relationships uh, without um, understanding it as a new region of being. And as always, he uses the term absolute essence um in what sense in what sense is it absolute later on in the text i think that husserl says um that absolute emerges in terms of absolute self-sufficiency like it's founded on itself it doesn't need any any other uh foundation so then uh is it a logical uh, absoluteness, and if it's a logical absoluteness, um, uh, what is the nature of our reference to lived? Is lived logical or does it imply something? Uh, well, it's first person, uh, so um. It's not just purely mental. So either our whole picture of the world is false because we have things as purely mental and analytic without bringing subjectivity into it uh, as lived. So this whole picture of the world then is false if we omit subjectivity. Or is subjectivity only a set of relationships rather than some kind of additional givenness uh, that it brings in. Um, if, if, if I make sense, I, I mean, but that's where I'm um, uh, kind of not allowing myself to fully accept what the book gives. Um, yeah. I, I would love to, answer one-on-one, -on -one, but we'll lose yeah. the time that way. So 
maybe what I can do is allow other people to respond to Olga or or make comments or ask questions, and I can try to internalize what you said and, and address it as we go. Um, but I, I I hear you what you said. I hear it. And you can either respond to Olga or raise your own uh, comments or questions. Uh, may I, uh, Peter? Yeah. Hello. Yeah, I was re while reading that section 37, you know, towards page 77 bottom. I mean, I always thought that, uh, you know, uh, while reading Being and Time of Heidegger, that Heidegger was making a, you know, path breaking, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, declaration that uh, readiness to hand, you know, so hand and heat is the primary mode. And I always thought that Husserl was, uh, you know, making the present at hand as the primary way of, you know, dealing with things. But while reading this now, you know, this time it occurs to me that that valuing is a seizing upon is loving something. You know, you say seizing also the loud. That practicality is very much uh, can be seen. That's what I feel. This is just an observation. Thank you. Thank you, Koshi. That's really helpful. I guess in slightly in response to what Olga says, I think it really is uh, issue how the word absolute comes into this. That um, we can analyze consciousness, but, but maybe I don't even have to go on about that. But I think that is something, maybe it's justified, but I'm not sure he adequately justifies that. I guess that, I think that's a real question. It's definitely a real question. And I hope to, to respond to just both the initial set and this set and what comes, but absolutely, Jeremy, thank you. In um, section 33, um, Husserl says, this is um, not your translation, but it's another one that I'm using. But he says um, that consciousness in itself is a being of its own, which in its absolute uniqueness of nature remains unaffected by the phenomenological disconnection, which is the epoche. So <clears throat> I guess this is getting at um, part of um, Olga's question. Um, it's not entirely, this word being is of course always very interesting. And um, so what does it mean to have a being of its own? Um, so I think what he's trying to get at here is that even after the reduction that um, this disconnection, um, that something still remains. Um, and he calls it phenomenological residu residuum. So, so is that what it means to have a being? Is that something remains? We don't say what it is exactly. I don't think it has to be what um, Olga says, some sort of substance. I don't think it has to be like that, but something remains. Let me just say one thing, and then maybe we have time for one or two more people, unless David, you were about to say something, in which case I defer to you. Nope, sorry if I gave you that impression. That's all right. Um, so I both think that, Olga, you had mentioned about relationships. I both think 
that what Husserl means here by absolute being is absolute relation. I think it is about relation and it's how that relation is the flow of meaning uh, in a twofold way, object and subject becomes differentiated. Um, and I also sort of side with what I take Bill to be your, your comment, which is that it doesn't necessarily have to be a being in the way we ordinarily think of being. Um, it is an experience in which um, we are present within the situatedness of consciousness and object. And that is an experience of, as Bill said, something, but what that something is, um, is the subject of phenomenology, is the, is the process of describing it. This is going to give the wrong impression. I don't believe that, you know, at the end of either the science of logic or the phenomenology of spirit, the absolute that Hegel talks about is the absolute here. But I think it's closer to that than it is uh, like a pencil or a person or something. Like it, it's, it's the event of the birth of being that is itself a being, right? And so out of that, the natural attitude and the being lost in the world makes sense. It makes sense that we would presume separation or distinguish between consciousness and world or consciousness and object only if we were given as thoroughly enmeshed. So the region of individual being is the enmeshment, as it were. Um, it is the totality of our experience, or as Felix said, our performance of already being with, to go back to Koshi's point about Heidegger. So anyway, that's all I'll say because I want you all to be able to talk and you're gonna hear more about this from me anyway. Maybe a way to sum that up is the reason we can call this absolute is that he's talking about what it even means for anything to be as such. And that's what you're getting at when you talk about our situatedness, our situatedness. Peter, quick remark. You have one more person in the audience. A huge riparian rabbit just came to the window and settled in. Oh, in your house. I was trying to figure out which one of us was the rabbit. I wasn't sure if it was Jeff because he joined just last. Just right, <laughs> like five yards, three yards away from the computer screen, but outside metaphorizing subject object <laughs> engagement. And, and motion probably and, and rapidity, yes. With huge ears, <laughs> nearly like Moses. Any other, that's great. Any other thoughts before we move on? I realize that I may be disappointing some of you and my not answering you directly. I do appreciate the fact that you are listening to, to mostly to me and also speaking. Um, and I will do my best to answer to what you give. Um, and I'll, I'll continue until you, until you tell me to stop. Um, so let's go on to section 41. In the middle, well, the first full paragraph at the end, Husserl begins with a discussion of, quote, the mutual relationship of subject and object or of transcendent and imminent. That's page 86, first full paragraph. So it's about the mutual relationship. This is a strange relation, one might say, in which thing and um, consciousness transcendent and imminent are, quote, essentially interrelated in the next paragraph or referred to one another auf ein ander bezogen, without being combined. That's what he says right there in the end of that first paragraph. In the perception of the table that unfolds while walking around it, Husserl emphasizes that the perception itself of the same table is grounded by the table 
and allows the perception as a quote flux to have a continuous meaning within consciousness itself, which is also on page 87, a flux. So this is the top of 87, about three lines down. My act retains the character of consciousness as a whole. The act, consciousness also, is flux, flow, continuous shifting. The object brings a certain style to the flow, a projected order in which meaning as the unity of subject and object can be focused on. Meaning is the property of neither one on its own. That could be a contentious claim, but I'm going to say it again. Meaning is the property of neither one on its own. The table itself is recognized as also participating in the flow of perceiving it through adumbrations. The sketching out of the same color of the top happens by means of the slight differences of brown and black and white, etc. You can look at your own table. Hopefully you see the little differences in adumbrations of color flex. The sameness appears within the flux and within the leaving behind of internal differences of color qualities that quite frankly do not appear without closer abstractive perception. The intending act of consciousness is thus doubly indebted to the difference that the table offers. Consciousness sees through the variation of perspective and side. It sees through and by means of the variations of shape and color to form and quality. The being given in person, Leibhaftig, is thus an achievement of interrelation, of regulated internal and external change. If you look at the top of page 88, about five lines down, Husserl says, quote, the perceptual multiplicities themselves always have their determinate descriptional composition essentially coordinated with that unity. This means that the thing as intentional unity does some work within the larger experience that situates us both. It helps, the thing helps, to coordinate the multiplicity of our acts by means of its unity of internal moments. The thing reflects its unity as both the foundation and the product of the unity of consciousness. That could also be contentious, but I'm going to say it again. The thing reflects its unity as both the foundation and the product of the unity of consciousness. However, Husserl is clear that the thing for all its activity, agency, and participation within the experience that situates us keeps its difference and distance. The thing is adumbrated. The experience is not. Yet adumbration, like the general thesis of the natural attitude, adumbration is in their labeness, the bottom of page 88. Five lines up, adumbrating is a mental process, is a lived experience. Adumbrations point toward the unity of the thing or of the quality. The thing points toward the unity of consciousness in its changing regard and attending. Consciousness points toward the thing as a full intentional correlate of the acts that the thing calls forth. Now I'm going to switch to sections 42 and 43, and I'm going to break it 40 after 49. In section 42, Husserl emphasizes that the mode of givenness of an object of perception, or indeed an object of any lived experience as such, cannot be imminent. Thus, although the lived experience is always of something, the way the lived experience includes its object is by way of radical difference. This goes towards something like what Olga asked at the beginning. The thing is not, quote, contained in the lived experience and thus cannot be, quote, found at all in the concatenations of mental processes. This is on page 90, in the, like, 15 lines down from the top, a little bit above halfway, cannot be found in the concatenations of mental processes. That is, the concatenation of experience, say of walking around the house to see its sides, marks out or traces the thing's initial givenness and continuous influence, but does not itself, the walking around, does not itself give the thing. 
Rather, the concatenation of experience functions as a response to what is adumbrated by what is not adumbrated, namely consciousness. Whereas Husserl makes clear at the bottom of page 90, an erlebnis, a mental process, is not adumbrated, but given all at once. There is thus a tension. On the one hand, the adumbrations of the surface color of the table lead us to see the same unitary surface color, brown. The adumbrated calls for and brings about the unity of the harmoniously presentive consciousness. That's on page 91. Um, I can't see it right now, but it's there. On the other hand, it is the self-givenness of consciousness in its total unity that allows the adumbrations to begin to move toward their idea, as it were. This is on uh, page 92, which is at the top, so three lines down. The spatial thing is nothing other than an intentional unity, which of essential necessity can be given only as the unity of such modes of appearance. So I'm just gonna repeat what I just said because I think it's important. Um, the atom braided calls for and brings about the unity of consciousness. On the other hand, the self-givenness of consciousness allows the adumbrations to move toward their fullness as the quality or the idea. But this last thing that I read on page 92 at the top is worth reading several times. This thing about the spatial thing is nothing other than an intentional unity. It is here, I think, in this kind of sentence that Husserl is misinterpreted as solely cognitive, as insisting that constitution means creation. I disagree with that. Even, I think, Sokolowski many years ago disagreed with that. Rather, I believe that being an intentional unity means that consciousness is not superior or creative of the object. Within the experience as such, the multiplicity of the adumbrated and non-adumbrated is what has always already brought about their unity. And again, within experience as overarching, that unity is what sustains their multiplicity in order for experience as such to continue to flow and to recognize new meanings. Section 44, the perception of something that appears necessarily appears within a, quote, horizon of co-givenness. This is on page 94. The horizon of co-givenness, this is like 10 lines down from the beginning of 44, which is not givenness proper. It's a horizon uneigentlicher mit gegebenheit. The co-givenness of other aspects, things, and world, then, is uneigentlicher, or not the thing's own in its immediate appearance. And yet the thing would not appear without what is not its own, would not appear without an indeterminateness that sets consciousness to its task at the very moment of the thing's appearance. Determining the thing's indeterminate co-givenness is the motor of consciousness. It is that which engages the futural, future-oriented character of consciousness. And this too is on 94, um, about five lines down from where we just were with co-givenness in italics. It's the next italics, I think. Um, he says, the indeterminateness necessarily signifies a determinableness which has a rigorously prescribed style. Vorgeschriebenen styles. I'm sorry for the bad pronunciation. It points ahead, deutet vor. The way determinable sense or meaning gathers around the indeterminate appearance of the full thing is pre written. Points ahead or is pre written, prescribed style as if by the complex of lived experience, in this case, perception itself. The style is one of engaging time consciousness. We are conscious of the more in the thing's appearance and of how it leads us to pick it up, turn it over, move around it, etc. The indeterminacy, the imperfection, the engagement of the future that we are already coming to be, this is, quote, 
part of the unannullable, and that was unaufhebbaren, essence of the correlation between object and subject. The intertwining of my own future and the indeterminacy of the thing as rooted in its determinacy, this is the meaning of transcendence. So the way my future maps onto the indeterminacy of the thing as rooted in its determinacy, that's what the transcendence is. As Husserl says on page 95 in the middle, the being of something transcendent, understood as being for an ego, can become given only in a manner analogous to that in which a physical thing is given, therefore through appearances. Um, one other problem in this translation is that every time the word ding occurs, the translator puts physical thing. It's only ding. So um, just note that, and then you know, we can talk about that as well. So this claim, that the being of something transcendent can only become given in a manner analogous to a thing in perception. This claim will be important later when considering the manner in which consciousness appears as transcendent to itself, or insofar as God or other people might appear as transcendent to us. The intertwining of indeterminacy and determinacy as engaging consciousness as its very motor and temporality Transcendence as the project of consciousness as embedded in lived experience. Transcendence as the not yet or the not itself that consciousness traces as embedded in its own situation. This is the meaning of transcendence for Husserl. Lived experience, Husserl says, is a quote, simple seeing, not something that has sides. Consciousness is an act a life, as Felix said, a performance, thus has no sides. It is immediately present to itself. Thus lived experience and that which the experience is of cannot simply be reducible to each other. They are not convertible, even though the thing is the unity of my not yet actions, my non-actional actions within the actionality they are still not actually convertible. Even as a lived experience can become an object of regard, we can see our act of seeing. This does not change the character of the lived experience. It keeps its act character, even as the object is embedded in it as it's of what? The temporality of experience, of lived experience, is thus what Husserl highlights here. On page 97, this is one of my favorite passages in ideas form. The lived experience, as Husserl says on page 97, and it's, um, I think, in the first full paragraph in the middle, he says, is with respect to its essence in flux, which we can swim along after it, starting from the now points, while the stretches already covered are lost to our perception. So part of the absolute character of lived experience then is that it announces in a very different manner its own indeterminacy as embedded in its determinacy, sort of like the thing, but pretty different. Rather than the futural pointing toward of the object's indeterminacy, our lived experiences point resolutely to their present flowing character as resistant to our own view. The lived experience that is our object and we ourselves, the ones seeing the particular lived experience that is ours, are within the same flow, are simply co-inflections of the same total flow of consciousness. Thus, we can, quote, swim along after the lived experience of hearing the previous sentence of this discourse. But we can never swim along side by side, and we can't swim very long either. Quote, my whole stream of mental processes is, finally, a unity of mental processes, lived experiences, which of ne essential necessity cannot be, unmuglich ist, cannot be seized upon completely in a perceiving which swims along with it. We cannot swim fast enough to overtake our own lived experience, let's say in memory. Um, and we even 
current perception. And we cannot, by swimming, get high enough above the flux to see its trajectory, its wake, and its transition into another lived experience. By contrast, the thing is given as a whole that is determinable indeterminacy. It is given as a total essence or idea within its appearances. And thus there is always an I can that is embedded in consciousness of something. The thing's fullness may be given as an idea, but is pre-written, as he said, in a rigorous style. We are aware that it is actually impossible to see the thing all at once from all possible perspectives. And yet that fact is not disappointing. Rather, the impossibility energizes us as the connection between other sides and future acts of perception is always already given as solid, motivated, and meaningful. The lived experience, by contrast, is given as absolute, as actually what consciousness is, and yet as action, as inherently temporal. The lived experience, per se, is not determinable indeterminacy that gears into us, going back to Gordon's question about hair on coming, Rather, the lived experience is us. That means that there is a loss of the lived experience as it becomes past, a lostness that is different in kind from the sides we have just seen receding from view as we walk around the building. We can always go back to the ones we passed. Can't, we can't get back to the lived experience in the same way. In the context of seeing our own lived experience of the last sentence, or even of words within that sentence, our swimming along with it cannot prevent the stretches that are passed from being lost. We cannot focus on the next word if we hold on to the previous one. We cannot hear the melody if we hear the note. And so the whole of the lived experience being given immediately and as absolute does not in ideality guarantee the impossible. The ego is just a different kind of flowing thing which flows according to its own act and whose absoluteness as the whole that it is prevents a unique temporal or spatial position from grasping it in adequacy in a different manner than the embedded transcendence prevents the spatial or temporal position of complete adequacy and fullness. I'm going on to section 45. In 45, Husserl tries to mark out a bit more of what separates the givenness of the object of lived experience from the lived experience itself as a kind of object. When we talk about the lived experience itself, say of the experience of remembering our last meeting together, we see that the lived experience, quote, is essentially capable of being perceived in reflection. Everyone here can remember the last meeting and how they felt or what they remember. Reflection is the means whereby we differentiate the sense of transcendence from imminence. If we reflect on what the webinar means to us, irritating, helpful, boring, exciting, whatever it is, that which we reflect on is primarily the lived experience. The webinar itself, the object, is relevant only insofar as we can reflect on the lived experience as such. Reflection is not the operation, the action that we use in order to make determinate the object's indeterminacy. What leads us to see more of the thing, to see the thing for the first time, is the following out of motivation. So this is where I'm, I'm on page 99. Quote, that the unperceived thing is there means rather that from my actually present perceptions with the actually appearing background field, possible and moreover continuously, harmoniously motivated perception sequences lead to those concatenations of perceptions. It's uh, perception sequences that are motivated leading to concatenations of perceptions in which the physical thing in question would make its appearance. And that was page 99. Um, that was at the bottom, the last five lines. The thing that my lived experience is of must thereby be in a situation of references to other moments and things and the entire perceptual or lived field as such in order to appeal, appear. The path that I follow from indeterminacy to determinacy, from inappearance to appearance, is motivation. This is a page 100 at the top. A transcendency which lacked such a concatenation essentially would be nonsensical. 
Motivations then are chains of embedded references that map acts of mind onto sides or aspects or adumbrations of the thing. That's not to say we can't reflect on things and find them, but that reflection would have to gear into what's more important, what's more foundational in the perception of things, which is motivation. Reflection by contrast then seems to be a different sort of thing. <clears throat> we don't follow motivations necessarily in order to remember or to anticipate or to be present to a lived experience. We reflect on a lived experience and we reflect for all kinds of reasons. We might call them motivations in a psychological sense. I reflect on the experience with my daughter yesterday because I am proud of her or had an argument with her and that bothers me. And yet that motivate, notion of motivation is not enough to get to the immediacy, the way in which we bring to givenness the entire experience, including my daughter, in that remembering and reflection. This is section 46 now. The entrance of reflection as the mechanism whereby the lived experience appears to us helps to differentiate the manners of givenness that we experience. Reflection seizes upon a lived experience in a way that, quote, on page 100, um, about four lines down from the top of 46, I have seized upon something absolute itself. The whole lived experience in its absolute existence is guaranteed now in the now. And this is true not just of the lived experience as a flow within my flow as such, but it is true of the entire flow. The particular lived experience is not a piece of my flow. It is not an aspect. Perhaps it's a kind of inflection. It has a unity and character that is quite different from the relations of implicit connection with the world that the thing itself has. When I reflect upon and remember my lived experience of the last webinar or a conversation with my daughter, I follow the streaming of that lived experience for moments, but I do not follow it out as I follow out the motivations from one word to the next in reading a sentence. More is lost in the lived experience insofar as more is given. The whole lived experience is given. It exists, it cannot be doubted right now. To bring moments of the lived experience to view is, however, difficult. I can only reenact it, witness it, allow it to flow its course. I cannot go this way or that. I follow no motivations. I follow the experience itself as a whole, for the experience has no parts. It does not appear in that way. It appears as an absolute that is given in its fullness. I simply am united with it, and yet because of its act character, and it's being a flow of temporality in itself, a flow of my own temporality, I cannot master it. I take it that's what the hermeneutic circle sort of is, especially when we reflect on our own lived experience. It is in this attempt to distinguish the reflective <laughs> grasping of a lived experience from a motivated grasp of the thing as a determinable indeterminacy that Husserl then moves into the discussion of contingency and necessity. As he says at the top of page 102, no perception presents anything absolute in that realm. It's at the top of second and third line. The givenness of the object of experience is contingent. Our experience is always open of things, of that which appears. We are not in control of the thing's appearance, but receive its givenness and respond to it within a pre-delineated system of references. The essence of the transcendent within our lived experience is to motivate a possible transformation of our experiential life in terms of its further sides or in the uncovering we perform of its relations with all other things. This possibility of transformation, however, means that the thing does not have its ontology solely within itself. Itself, its ownness, its Leibhaftigkeit, still depends on my own. This is at the bottom of 102 over to 103. Quote, anything physical which is given in person, alles Leibhaft gegebene Dingliche, can be non-existent. No mental process which is given in person can be non-existent. 
kein Leibhaft gegebenes Erlebnis. So notice the Leibhaft appears both in the thing and in the lived experience. I really think that's worth thinking through a lot. Um, lived experience then is a whole in which we are referred to the things further sides or aspects that are embedded with our future acts. And in that same lived experience, this being referred to our future and its intertwining with the meaning of the thing for us, this being referred is possible because the thing's lib, lived body, flesh, is referred to our own. Or to put it more precisely, the lived experience itself has already assured the thing's agency by a transfer of our Leibhaftig gegebene character to it without our noticing. The thing borrows our agency before we know it in order to appear. It returns our agency to us in the form of our necessity and self-transparency in reflection as a way to process the whole situation of ourselves and things embedded in one another. That's as close to the <clears> whole <throat> that I have that I can give you, right? So it's, it's this transfer. When Husserl thus says on page 103 that the possibility of the non-being of the world is never excluded, this is right at the middle. Um, possibility of the non-being of the world is never excluded. What I think he means is that nothing about our acts guarantees the ontology of transcendence. We are not responsible for the separate being of the thing, if it in fact is separate. We are only responsible for the intertwining of thing and consciousness, responsible not as a creator, but as a steward, one who should not bury the talents given, but invest them explicitly. I'm referring to the gospel story where you know, the master berates the people who just bury the talents. Apocalyptic discussions, fears of nuclear annihilation, being towards death, these are all capable of drawing our attention. Why? Because we are embedded in the world of, as horizon and the world embedded in us. And yet for all of that, we cannot extend the guarantee of reflection to the things on their own. We simply have to follow out motivations. Reflection has its sphere, motivation has its sphere. The differences and manners of givenness cannot be overcome, but they can be noticed and can direct our care in specific ways, i.e. it's because the world is embedded in us and we are embedded in the world that we ought to care about the world. On page 104, Husserl notes, quote, the essential detachableness of the whole natural world from the domains of consciousness. This is an important addition. It is not only the world that is, it is not only that the world is contingent, it is that the very character of world as world is detachable from consciousness. This seems to go against what I just said. So what are we saying and why is this important? If Husserl is right, what he's saying is important because it is this very detachability that guarantees that the world does not simply become a moment of our own. The world is embedded in us and we are embedded in the world and yet that embedding is not total or guaranteed. The otherness of the world is preserved then in this very contingency, vulnerability and detachability. It does not undo the intimacy of the situation of consciousness of, rather, what Husserl sees, the inherent detachability of the world, preserves the intimacy of the situation, preserves the alterity of the manners of givenness that are combined, transcendence and imminence. The essential difference in the manners of givenness allows for us to be essentially akin, Bill's point about essentially akin to, to essences, essentially akin to the objects we perceive while simultaneously understanding that it is lived experience that situates us both, flesh and flesh, live and live. 
I'm going to move to section 47, and I know that this is a huge chunk, and I know probably I've said things which people are going to object to and all of that, and I, I don't want to not allow you, but I, I, want, I feel some pressure to, to cover through 49 and then take a break. So, as, and I know that, Bill, you said this was really difficult, so I'm now doubting myself, but I will, I will continue, and you can, you can feel free to um, help me correct myself. So as Husserl says in section 47, um, and he continues to talk about the world as correlate of consciousness, he explores the intimacy that also allows for the dissolution of the bond. And Sally, this also goes to your question at the beginning. It is experience as such that situates both thing and consciousness. On page 106, about 10 lines from the top, he says, it is experience, Erfahrung, alone that prescribes, foreschreibt, their sense. It is actual experience alone which does so in its definitely ordered concatenations, Erfahrungs zusammenhangen. This concatenations is a word that this time reading through it, I, I really appreciate a lot, the hanging together, concatenated zusammenhangen. Uh, experience itself as a whole, the Erfahrung that seizes, Erfassen, upon the thing is something that is not just a ray of regard. It is the situation of grasping and that which is grasped. What is prescribed is the situatedness of the object within concatenations of experience. Sense is given as Leibhaftig only insofar as its flesh is the flesh of time and of following out, of work we have to do that we cannot see in detail in advance. If this were not true, there would be nothing new under the sun and Ecclesiastes would be the end. When Husserl moves on further to talk about how perception is the measure of transcendence on page 106, I read this as more of the same discussion. He says the following, the genuine concept, this is uh, the end of the big paragraph, like five lines before the end, Ekta begriff of the transcendence of something physical, again, physical is not mentioned, dinglika, can itself be derived, the genuine concept can itself be derived only from the proper essential contents of perception or from those concatenations of definite kinds which we call demonstrative experience, als weisende Erfahrung. It is experience then that allows the genuine concept of transcendence that allows, I would say, transcendence itself to appear. Experience, perception, consciousness as of something in intuition, this is the affirmation of our conscious life that we agree to follow motivations within the concatenations of possible conscious acts. We are given over to what is given over to us. We have work to do with it. And as we do the work, our consciousness on page 87, I mean, page 107, is, quote, always taking into itself new motivations and recasting those already formed. The newness and the recasting are possible then only insofar as we do not control in advance the path of our work. We follow the concatenations and in so doing, preserve the separability of the thing and its different manner of givenness from our own acts of experiencing. It's what time is for, to preserve the intimacy, which even though they are the unity of the object with ourselves, are given in a totally different manner. Postural seems to admit this on page 107. This is like uh, eight lines from the bottom of the broken large paragraph. This horizon, however, is the correlate of the components of the undeterminateness essentially attached to experiences of physical things themselves. The horizon is the woven tapestry of indeterminacies that are, quote, attached to the appearances of things. The horizon is our work, and yet it would not appear as our work to do. It would not engage our future unless it were separable from us as the kind of thing that we are most essentially. Its separability from us and its implicit, not explicit, support of the thing 
keeps it as a distinguishable moment of the whole complex ego thing horizon. To go back to Kogito, Kogitatsu, Kogitata. There is a kind of self transcendence that experience is able to demonstrate by way of its involvement with horizon and thing. Towards the bottom of page 107, Husserl remarks that any actual experience, this is a quote, points beyond itself to possible experiences. The pointing beyond is a corresponding yet not identical pointing beyond that the thing's currently perceived side or aspect engages to the other sides or aspects not currently in view. The pointing beyond of our experience to other experiences is the way in which we live and make transitions from meaning to meaning, from moment to moment. The world then is a horizon embedded in the situation of ego, horizon, and thing depends on the relation of experience pointing beyond itself. The world as the system of interconnections of meaningful aspects and things could not appear without the concatenation of experiences that pointed beyond themselves. Correlatively, the flow of consciousness itself, which is what reflection grasps, could not appear, reflection could not engage, without the concatenation of motivations of experiences that lead reflection to do work on particular experiences insofar as they became embedded within further living. So I have about two pages left on section 49, then we'll take a break. Um, so I'm on it, moving to section 49. Having discussed the detachability and contingency of the world and the absolute and necessary character of consciousness, Husserl now turns to the possibility that the world can be annihilated. Sally, this is as close as you're going to get to an answer to your question. This is not a new discussion in ideas, but it does bring to clarity the weakness, vulnerability, and danger that lies at the heart of consciousness. There is certainly implicit in what Husserl has already said that consciousness is made for work, for experience, for an intertwining with world as co-horizon that maps onto the concatenation of further acts of experience. However, Husserl emphasizes everything can fall apart. He like is like Chinua Achebe right here. So on page 109, in the middle of the first full paragraph, I think he says, experience might suddenly show itself to be refractory to the demand that it carry on its positings of things harmoniously that its context might lose its re fixed regular organizations. The suddenness by which this could happen implies a thought about death. Right? Experience could be refractory to the demand. I, I can be dying, I could die. But perhaps more importantly, it implies that we are not in full control of the intertwining of world and consciousness. That's what death is also. It's a realization that we're not in control. Uh, the admission of a lack of control is perhaps what Derrida and Heidegger are on to in the discussion of the impossible. The possibility of a sudden coming apart is also the possibility of the impossibility. It is a being toward death that both reinforces the intimacy of consciousness and world while also revealing its inherent weakness. When Husserl says on page 110, um, Consequently, no real being is necessary to the being of consciousness itself. One might be tempted to view this as a kind of cognitive superiority of thought to reality, or thought, Sally, to object. But I think it means that trauma, death, the sudden undoing of world from experience, does not eliminate the very process of experience the very process of consciousness as such. There is nothing in the essence of experience itself that does not allow it to explore different manners of givenness. We have already have at least two types of experience of what is not consciousness, of lived experiences or of consciousness itself. Trauma, anxiety, the threat of annihilation, these do not have to determine what consciousness is. One might say there are more things in heaven or on earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. And this sudden possibility of the refractory relationship between experience and things, this even does not undo the intimacy of world and consciousness, transcendence and imminence. 
Rather, the possibility of impossibility allows us to focus on just how wondrous it is that the two ever have been, always already are interconnected. As Husserl explores on page 111, and I think this is in the first full paragraph, the beginning, consciousness, mental process, Erlebnis, and real being, I love this paragraph, are anything but coordinate kinds of being, which dwell peaceably side by side and occasionally become related to or connected with one another. Only things which are essentially akin can make up a whole. End quote. This being essentially akin and coming together to make up a whole, this does not mean that their relationship is guaranteed, for the sudden impossibility of their interweaving shows us that, quote, and this goes directly to, I think, Felix, your point, a veritable abyss yawns, this is a quote from 111, between consciousness and reality. Adumbrated and contingent appearance given within concatenations of motivation, on the one hand, absolute and immediate non-appearance given by reflection on the other. These two belong together and are joined like two beings made out of one set of ribs, and yet which are separable by means of tragedy. If this were not the case, if transcendence and immanence, world and consciousness were not so thoroughly united, not despite, but through their essential differences or across the abyss, this were not the case, could Husserl go on to say in the same section on page 112 that consciousness, lived experience, and this goes, Olga, to your point, could be a self-contained complex of being. It's in the first paragraph in the italics. A complex of absolute being, and the emphasis that I want to put is on the last part, into which nothing can penetrate. So Gordon Heron Common implies like reaching or penetrating or being in each other, into which nothing can penetrate and out of which nothing can slip. So this is, I think, where he's going the entire section is to say, what is this individual being? What is this absolute being? This is a, a self-contained complex. And containment, Olga, I think is right. It, it, containment doesn't quite make sense because there's nothing to contain. Everything is there. It's like, you know, when, uh, when uh, James Joyce talked about the Catholic Church, he goes, here comes everybody. Like, here comes everything. Here it is. It's an entire self-contained complex of being. The embrace of world by consciousness is total, even if contingent and detachable. The irreducibility of world to consciousness, irreducibility, is total. It maintains itself as what is embedded. The rivets between the two are the future acts of consciousness, which each experience points toward by pointing beyond itself, and it each experience points beyond itself by means of following out the concatenations of motivation that the thing and the world sustain and offer from before the beginning. So even the criticism of phenomenology is only having to do with origins that John Salas offered many years ago. Like, we're before the beginning. <laughs> we're not even at the beginning. We're before the beginning. So if that is true, then the final paragraph of page 112 notes that the world is, quote, merely an intentional being, last section of, of paragraph of 49, needs careful interpretation of the world merely. It is not an attempt to reduce the world to consciousness. That's how many people read it. I don't think it's true. It is to say that the world's own being apart from consciousness is not relevant to consciousness. It cannot be conceived as an experience, and thus is not a sense that can be described with anything approaching evidence. What you have evidence for is the essential interweaving and the essential detachability. That you have evidence for in your experience. Whatever the world is apart from consciousness, who knows? Transcendence is thus what we make sense of by means of internal connections to us. 
but transcendence is not guaranteed on its own by means of us. We have some guarantee that it is not inconceivable that we survive after the removal of the world from our consciousness, perhaps because, Sally, we still have lived experiences as objects. But that is only the guarantee but that shows our being toward death as a possibility rooted in the very experience of having a world of co-givenness. So if the world does pass away, it is, I, love, I, I don't have very many good insights, but I think this one, if I'm wrong, I hope you won't tell me because I really want to believe this is true. Okay, so I'm, one more sentence and I'm done, but I really hope it's true. So if the world does pass away, it is the very experience of world that has given us a sense of our ability to move beyond that trauma. So anyway, that's the end of section 49, at least for me. I'd like to pause and allow for at least 10 minutes of discussion. I know that was a lot. I apologize. I look forward to hearing from you. Um, I think th this is a really appropriate place to sort of con conclude a section. It seems to me that in this section, we're really seeing what the phenomenological reduction discloses. And perhaps in the analysis leading up to that, it could have been misunderstood as if we're looking at a whole and just analyzing different parts of the whole. It, it, like there's consciousness, there's in the world, and there's this whole we're looking at. And so maybe up to a certain point, if we're saying we're just distinguishing consciousness from things, maybe we're doing that, but that is to not yet gain the insight that the phenomenological reduction makes possible or perhaps constitutes, which is this very suggestive and interesting way of putting it that, that you just, you've just focused on, I think very, very clearly. And um, um, that whatever consciousness it is, it's not just part of a whole. And uh, I guess th th that's just one thing I wanted to, I wanted to point out. Can I just uh, go back for a minute to page 97? Um, because it strikes me, uh, and, it, and it speaks to the question of the absolute as well, where he talks about, about a little bit more than halfway down the page, the incompleteness and imperfection of the mental process of the, of the, of the experience um, as, as, as two types of imperfection. And, and, and two things strike me about that. Firstly, is that when we hear absolute, we shouldn't hear completeness. We shouldn't hear perfection, right? Uh, it, it, it has its own incompleteness. The absolute is rather to do with a certain immediacy. Um, but secondly, that, and maybe I'm overreading it here, but it seems to me that, that he's dividing that incompleteness between a temporal incompleteness and a spatial incompleteness, right? The, the adumbration is something spatial. Um, and um, and 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 we're not adumbrated in 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 time, and because uh, we have a temporal flow. Um, and, and if that's true, then what we have here is kind of a, the, the distinction he's drawing between between thing and consciousness, between world and consciousness, perhaps has got to do with some sort of relationship between time and space. Um, that that we experience our own speciality first and foremost temporally, and we experience the te temporality of things first and, first and foremost spatially. Um, and, and if that, I mean, if that's not totally off, off course, then in terms of what, if I understood you, Peter, what you were trying to, 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 to articulate here is that um, what Husserl is trying to do is to articulate both the being of consciousness and also to um, to understand that there is a, there is a way of being which is foreign to us, which we cannot reach, uh, which is the, is that being of the thing, um, 
And, and, and what's interesting about that for me is that in a sense, it's kind of, it, it relativizes the distinction between a thing and other that we get was we'll say in the Cartesian meditations, because you have that same problematic here at play where the, the, the thingness, the, 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 the being of the thing is ultimately foreign, ultimately, uh, uh, absent. Uh, just very briefly, I love what you said, Felix, and I would agree. Um, I know that I have more uh, clarity to do on the distinction between, as you said beautifully, between our first understanding of ourselves as temporal versus our first understanding of a thing as spatial and how that maps on to temporality and spatiality for us. Um, what I, and I agree with that, but I really love the the relativizing that you talked about, especially with respect to the fifth Cartesian meditation and the appearance of the other person within the pairing that we do. And I think that um, what I take from the section you're pointing to and the way it gets us there is that the I cannot that I experience with respect to my own lived experience, I cannot swim along with it very well. That I cannot is strengthened by the appearance of the other person or of God, right? So the I cannot is almost prior to the I can in that sense. And it is a, a continuity that's also a, a kind of radical difference in kind, but they are alike enough to, to ground live everywhere. And so therefore, thereby relativize it, as you said. So I, I love what you're saying, and I'm sorry to respond, but I just, there are certain moments like Bill with your discussion of the, of the inherent uh, connection between my nature and the nature of essences. Similarly, Felix, I, I just feel very simpatico with the things you're raising. So I appreciate that a lot. Well, Peter, I wanted to thank you. Um, it, it was um, uh, changing uh, perception uh, in the um, state of uh, the mind so that the questions that he asked before, they don't arise against that uh, gestalt, uh, the direct perception. Um, but the question is, uh, so does one have ethical responsibility or what is the um, ethical, um, assessment of that uh, gestalt and where it stands in relation to life uh, in general. I mean, we are given a certain world uh, and this is, uh, this is different. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I mean, uh other people can jump in and correct me, but I have the feeling that if this, if I'm, if we are right in talking about the absolute, as Felix said, as immediate and not as complete, if we are right in talking about the situatedness of consciousness within an overarching experiential connection with world and with thing, then I think phenomenology is inherently ethical. It's not, it's always ethical. Like what our moves will be as the unfolding of the, uh, explicit from what is implicit is always to try to do justice to the thing, to the other person, to the situation, and to ourselves. Like it's it's always about Zuden Zaken selves, right? It's it that is an ethical move. And so I, I think I think I maybe I might have not formulated it exactly correctly. What I'm trying to say is that the understanding of the nature of the world when this whole new system of thinking and the gestalt which comes with it mm -hmm. uh, moves in. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality of the world mm -hmm. asks for redescription. I mean, all the sciences, uh, the way the physics, understanding of causes and effects, uh, the 
picture of cosmos, uh, not to talk about the social world, everything changes, right, uh, with that. It has to be like the whole system of knowledge has to be redone. Uh, in When one is on, uh, let's say, spiritual path, um, enlightenment is ethical, and then dependent on how one relates to it, uh, one can either give it, share it with people or use it uh, for oneself. You know, it's a worked out system of ethical commitments that contains what is thought to be religious uh, enlightenment. But here, one is having even a, um, a more profound change of the mind and more correct one in terms of aligning it with reality than happens in spiritual practice. So how does one, uh, so what you're saying is that uh, taking a stance in it and living life from it, uh, it's not a happy stage, it's not a, uh, it's not happy, it's, it's actually a lot of effort <laughs> that goes into maintaining this uh, perception. Uh, I, I, I wonder if I could, uh, something that was very uh, important for me, Peter, in uh, attending what you said, if I've got it right, <clears throat> The position is that meaning is imposed. Meaning is a construction on the flow. The, the second piece of that is meaning always carries value. Our meanings always entail or imply a, a value. We don't make value-free assessments of meaning. And if that's anything like true, then just as you said, phenomenology is always ethical because it's always one way or another value-laden. So I think if I understand you right, Gordon and Olga together, that um, I wouldn't say that meaning is an imposition by us, but neither simply an imposition nor simply a following, but sort of both at the same time, as it were, in following out the demands of the thing, the demands of other people, or the demands of the world. Um, we simply, in some sense, are innocent. We make explicit what is implicit. But at the same time, um, it's not value-free in the sense that we're following out in a limited way, in a finite way, concatenations of experience or motivations that could have proceeded otherwise. And so by being a finite being who only has a certain amount of time, let's say, or a certain amount of, of possibility, we, by seizing upon or discriminating within experience, we do affect the whole. And so that's why everything matters. That's why everything is ethical, at least insofar as I can say. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's like, both being responsible and being innocent at the same time and being guilty, all of them, because we're responding to givenness. And so it's a, it's a response, but it's also an initiative. It's also an interruption. It's also a, 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 a creation. It's like, we're at the, what I, I think Eugen Fink in the Six Cartesian Meditation tried to do some of this work. He's trying to say, look, the transcendental ego is before the one and the many. It's before that. 
So the problem of understanding how my ego is also the transcendental ego is only a problem if if you deny <laughs> that that the transcendental ego is before the one and the many. I think we're my view is we're here before in, in phenomenology before a lot of these distinctions make sense. And that's so wonderful because we can engage in description that is prejudice free as much as we can while also acknowledging we're finite beings that have to do this whole process of description and perhaps Olga, a revaluation of all of the sciences or whatever, um, we have to do it together because we have to keep checking whether the, the descriptions and the concepts that we are using derive from the experiences themselves and not from prejudices or failures of our own, which is why I think when Bill said that, you know, there has to be some internal connection with essences. I mean, that's, I'm just going to say this now, that's what he says in experience and judgment. He says, look, here's the process of coming to see an, an essence. You have variations, let's say, of a table, right? And you, you have one brown one with four legs, and then you run through all the possible variations. And up through those variations, through the overlaying of those variations, suddenly you see this essence of what it is to be a table. Now, your variation, your, your actual acting to shift the, the, the qualities around number of legs, size, shape, um, color, that had something to do with your capacity to see that essence. But it didn't on its own generate it. The essence gave itself through the overlaying. And the wonderful thing that happens in, in the relation between experience and judgment and what Felix was talking about in the fifth Cartesian meditation is that's exactly how we get to the essence of intersubjectivity and transcendental ego. You, you have you and the other person overlaying one another and up through that comes this, oh my God, we're interrelated in this essential way, right? So the thing I do with other people is what I then deploy to variations. And in both cases, what happens is I get my connection with them. I get the connection of the essence with the variations. It's the same process. It uses, the, Husserl uses the same terms. Everything is happening as a single system of interrelated complexes of being, which is why Felix's point about relativization, relativization is so important. What I do with things, I do as a whole being with others. And so that's, that's the internal consistency. That's the internal logic of what's going on here. That's why I think it's so ethical, right? Because things are the echoes of our relations with others, to put it that way. Sorry, I talked too long. Thank you. I, I, I found that really very uh, enlightening. That, 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 that really helped a lot. I, I mean, I mean, I, I think one way of putting that is that Husserl is working always within the middle voice, right? And, and that we misunderstand him when we don't see that, right? And, and it's, it's always a letting, a letting appear. And, and the work is the work of allowing it to appear. Um, and that's the phenomenological work. But it's not a projection, right? He's not, it's not projecting meaning. So when he talks about constitution, He's, ta he's talking in the middle voice. He's talking about, you know, as you say, with, with variation, you, you, you're letting something come to appearance. Um, and and, and, and that, that, that I just wanted to say that, that to, to me, that, 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 that's what's going on here. We have to make a decision and either way is fine with me. Um, I would happily go on and finish 50 to 60 together with all of us. I can also, you know, we can wait and do that next time with the next chunk. I'm happy to go either way, but I, I you know, people might be burnt out on me, probably not on Husserl, but you might be burnt out on me. So um, can I just understand what people would like? You know, um, I think be, uh, Sally, Sally has a message, sorry, but I have to leave at noon. Yeah, uh, but I'm thinking on the other hand, you know, uh, well, Jeff has to go. Um, we, we are recording the session. That's an advantage, right? So we all can go through it afterwards, obviously. Um, but 
uh, we also can perhaps, Peter, I don't know, will you be open to extending the webinar maybe uh, by one meeting? Because uh, that's the other thing that we can do. I know that for me, for example, what was recorded today, uh, it will take me hours of going back, rereading, rethinking, etc. So um, we may as well just uh, make an updated schedule, adding one more session. Okay. Um, that's just a su suggestion. What do you think? I think that's fine if people are, are willing to do that. And, and because Jeff and Sally have to leave, I would hate to not have them here to contribute. So um, yeah, I, let's do that. Let's um, do 50 to 60 for next time and I'll send out a, a chunk to do. We'll extend it by one month. We'll do one more session. Um, just, just as a quick note before everyone leaves, the, the part, not for next time probably, but for the time after in the sections numbering 80 and beyond is where he starts to use the language of noesis and noema. And that language really does the work that I'm trying. I may be forcing a little bit on the earlier sections, but when you get to that, I think you'll say, oh, I see some evidence for what Peter is saying, as opposed to him just doing these crazy ramblings on his own. Like, I, I really do believe that the Hosterl supports this reading in those in those sections explicitly and Gordon with, with very technical language. I have to say, Peter, that the epoche uh, performed today, uh, well, well oh, I, I see you, was, is so powerful. It was so powerful this reading, uh, the way you did it and together with the group uh, and, and uh, showing the flow of material that the doubt is removed through direct perception, unaltered, but yet direct, it expands. So uh, if it will be possible to ground it through noises and Nayama discussion, in a more kind of capsulized concepts, it will be helpful, but it's already happening in the current uh, presentation. Good. And, and before you leave, just, you know, please know that all of your contributions really help flesh out these things. Like I've shifted, you don't know this, as mostly I've been reading, but as I've been reading what I've written to prepare, I have been changing based on some things that you've done and i just i genuinely appreciate everyone who's who's contributing and i'm willing to be corrected or to be um you know please send me stuff if you would like to so that we can uh, continue the conversation otherwise i'm just very grateful for spending time with with us today and i i look forward to next time Bye -bye. We have the recording and I think I'll post it already on the website and make it.